Hello guys of United Rock Nations, uh, we are with Marek of Amulet uh, from uh, England. Uh, how are you? Very good, thanks. Great talking to you. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the station launch. <laughs> so, um, it's the first time uh, we interview you, so we didn't know exactly, we don't know exactly who uh, is Amulet. So can you tell us a little bit about the story of the band? Yeah, sure. We are a London heavy metal band. We formed in 2010. Um, we were at a music festival and thought, oh, there's room for a really good, honest heavy metal band. We just want to write some good songs and keep it simple. So we um, eventually realized that some of our good friends had the same idea as well. So it's um, five friends basically together trying to create some good, simple, heavy rocking songs. Um, in the in the classic tradition, but in our own way. Um, why you choose Amulet as as a name of the band? It's a strange name for a heavy metal band. I, is it? Uh, yeah, I mean, Metallica's original name was Leather Charm, which is kind of similar. I think it's harking back to the sort of '80s. I guess when the things that we're into, like fantasy movies. Um, and you know magic i grew up with lord of the rings and you know and led zeppelin and black sabbath singing about wizards and things so i think amulet seemed like a positive word and um and quite a nice sort of fantastical but powerful word as well because the amulet gives you power and uh protection so um we were sort of joking about being called heavy goods vehicle or hgv but Amulet came very quickly, and as soon as it was mentioned, we were like, yes, that's it. And kind of laughing, but also feeling on a deeper level it was the right name for us. And we've always, we've never doubted the name, it's always felt like the perfect name. Okay, so um, you play a new wave of British heavy metal style with Black Sabbath influences, but it's not the sound of your generation. Well, I'm a bit older than the others, as you can probably see. <laughs> um, so I, I, my, my brother and sister were older, so I actually remember the tail end of that era a little bit, sort of, the, if you like, the, I remember the late 80s a bit and, and that, that feeling of heavy metal being just what everyone was into and Saxon was just a band that you liked and everyone had motorbikes and they played Dungeons and Dragons and so I remember that, so for me it's got this slightly mystical feeling of the past that I can almost remember. I think for the other guys, it's just we're all music fans, first of all. And um, I think if you devote yourself in a single minded way to any art form, like we have with heavy metal, eventually you arguably realize that the, the early masters of whether it's painting or literature tend to be the most pure examples of the form. So I think we've naturally just, that's what we listen to day to day. So it wasn't really a conscious decision, it's just what we listen to. So when we pick up a guitar, we play that kind of music. Um, we wouldn't call ourselves New Wave of British Heavy Metal, but they are definitely one of, that's, that's the era that we like. And we love French bands, actually. Um, there's a band called Stratson that we really like. Um, Satan's Jokers. Um, there's a lot of kind of obscure French acts. Um, we, they're some of our favourites actually, alongside the usual kind of British bands from that era like Diamond Head. Uh, how, how do you explain the success of Cut the Crap? <laughs> um, I guess so, yeah. I think um, people like it, which is a success. Um, and we've got a good record deal, which is great. I think it's just the honesty in it. Like what. I can I can accept the success that we're having now. I think because I know that we are just ridiculously devoted to the music, and all of us individually have done things through our lives, from playing it at a young age to going to shows every day and week and buying records, through to going on tour with bands and not getting paid or putting on shows and giving all the money to bands. And so I think it, hopefully that kind of honesty and um, love for the music comes across. I think it's just hopefully good songs as well and 
a good atmosphere. Um, yeah, I mean, we're quite cool too. Maybe <laughs> quite cool. <laughs> um, uh, on the new album, the first, uh, there isn't any track of the EP "Cut the Crap." Why? Um, because the EP is now quite old. Because we had to get a full lineup together and write the album, and. I always felt like if you've already bought something once, you don't want to buy it again. So it's more it's better value for the fans to get all new material. Um, I always prefer that. You know, I've already got that. I don't want it again. And also, if you've already recorded it and you're happy with it, it's always very hard to recreate that again. It's hard to improve. I very, you very rarely find people saying, "Oh, I prefer the the album version to the demo." They always prefer the demo. Because it's a, the demo is a bit more raw and real, so rather than make a worse version, we thought we'd just write some new songs. Um, let me know about the writing process. Who wrote the songs? There are one or two that that individuals wrote in the band, like Mark of Evil. It was just released. Um, our singer Jamie just came to that one day and said, "I've got this new song." We were like, "Holy cow, that's amazing!" Uh, And there's a f like the one Heathen Castle, I guess I kind of wrote that one because I'm Heathen Stephen, um, musically. Um, the rest of them, and, and even those ones, we all have a lot of input. It's your classic band where we just have a few riffs and you bash them around and you all put input, input ideas. And I think we're, we've got a really good atmosphere in the band for kind of uh, each bringing our own elements to it. And I think in anything, if you can collaborate positively then you're going to end up with a better result so it's it's a case of being polite to each other and improving it gradually um, you know with your own elements added really and then our singer tends to write most of the lyrics and the melodies for the vocals so so, so it's, it's not a collective uh, way of composing for example your rehearsal then you, you you compose all together each one brings his ideas yes and um, Yeah, we all basically have pretty much the same taste, so that's what makes it very easy. Um, but then, yeah, someone will bring a, a, a new idea, or I quite like coming up with little ideas, like, oh, the drums should stop there for a minute, and then suddenly the riff sounds interesting when they come back. So it's the small ideas, I think. If you just write a basic, get a few riffs that you like down that sound good, and then, then try and make it sound interesting. <laughs> that's really uh, that's the secret. What is interesting on your song, when, when I listen to the song, in many times, you introduce some rhythm changing on, on the songs. For example, Black Candle, uh, The Gauntlet. Um, it's, a, it's a new way of, of thinking about heavy metal. Oh, that's nice that you say that. So, yeah, the, sort of, the tempo changes in there. Um, I honestly don't, I honestly would say we could do with more of those. I think it's just one of the ways you can keep the listener interested, I guess. If the, uh, if the timing and the tempo changes, then it perks your ears up and keeps you, you know, interested in what's happening. It's stimulating. So I think that's really what we try and do, is just have very simple riffs, because they're usually the best ones, and then think of ways like changing the timing to make it interesting for the listener, because we're all experts at listening to stuff. We listen to things all day. Um, and especially heavy metal fans, They're, they listen to all these amazing musicians. So you can't keep it too simple. Um, but we tr we like to we like to keep it simple because that's um, the kind of the way that we want the music to be really. Okay. Um, uh, the mix of the album sounds very raw. Raw. Um, it's uh, it's your choice. Yeah. Um, I think that's one of the things we would admit that we'd look to the past for, is that the uh, production on, say, a Judas Priest record of 1976, um, or uh, the first Metallica album, you know, where you, it's heavy guitars and it's overdriven, but it's not, it's not all cranked completely to the max. Um, it leaves more room for the bass and the drums, and it's, it makes it ultimately, we think, more listenable. So we just plug the guitars into the, the marshals and um, keep the distortion low, but turn the volume up. Um, there are no tricks to make it sound that way. It's just um, keeping it as bare as you can, really. But 
we, it's really loud in the room when you record it and it sounds really heavy but because we don't then put it into a computer and make sure everything is maxed to the, the top level of bass and middle and um, whatever the other elements are then it sounds more raw than the things that we often listen to now um, um, usually uh, decision, yeah. usually there, there's always a ballad on a heavy metal album but not in yours <laughs> there is no ballad yeah well, um, maybe on the next one I think um, partly that could be because it's intimidating to write a proper song you know like an actual song like that um, also we probably think it's a little bit like wussy we could say in England like a bit you know lame you know um, to write a lovey-dovey kind of song or a slower one um, so we try to keep have a bit of dynamics like that by having the keyboard song we've got like a, a keyboard song that Dave played on drums uh, on keyboard and um, a kind of sl couple of bits where it's a bit quieter um, yeah we're not trying to follow any formulas really we're just trying to write some good songs and maybe the next one uh, we selected some songs uh, that we want to talk about. The first one is Wicked and Cruel. Uh, it sounds different from the other tracks. It's more into American heavy metal than British heavy metal. Don't you think so? Yeah, I know what you mean. It's that kind of riff. The kind of... Yeah, it's a bit of that. Um, yeah, I think the vocal came out quite catchy in the end on that one. That was actually the sixth song we wrote so that's quite old it's almost two years old and I think if I'm honest I think that's the one on the album that we like the least I don't I don't know if that's because it sounds American um, I think it's just that maybe it's just old and I think now we're better at writing songs maybe but it's still still think like a good song but um, maybe that we didn't have as much love for it so when we recorded it it doesn't have that you, you, you won't play it on live um, we have done quite a lot, obviously, when we were starting out. Uh, I would say it's unlikely we'll play that one, but I like it. I think it's, it's a good song, so you never know. Nightmare uh, is longer, uh, but at the same time, it's the perfect mix of all your influences. Ah, cool. don't, don't you? <laughs> Black Sabbath, uh, uh, Saxon, Iron Maiden, don't, don't you think so? Yeah, you're right. I mean, that's that's great. That's a, that's a nice compliment. Thank you. I think that was one of the last songs we wrote, and now we have Nippy Blackford in the band. He's an amazing guitarist and musician, um, huge Iron Maiden fan, and everything else. I think having him, the amulet is kind of complete in a way, and that I think what we're going to create in the future is going to be quite exciting. So I think we were trying to throw throw all the last bits that we could do into the album in the last songs we wrote which were The Gauntlet and um, Nightmare and they're both the, kind of the longer more complex I guess songs so oh thank you yeah uh, the last song it's Evil Cathedral it sounds like a motorhead song <laughs> <laughs> no? yeah someone else said that but the beginning is the same of Overkill for example yeah I mean it Motorhead are one of the sort of five bedrocks of heavy metal already, aren't they? Black Sabbath, Motorhead, maybe Iron Maiden, uh, Judas Priest, and uh, I, we'd say Deep Purple, I think, because they've got a slightly different way of playing. Um, so you, in that sense, it's kind of like um, they're, Motorhead are almost a tool that you use rather than an influence. Um, although that definitely wasn't an intentional thing. I think when you have that drums, the, the D beat, then it sounds, you're thinking Motorhead straight away. Um, so yeah, I think on the guitar I was trying I was trying to do a sort of Motorhead kind of thing as well. But because um, Jamie's vocals are quite different, I guess we can get away with it. Uh, as, as a guitarist, what, what is your, your the, the guitarist that impressed you the most? That's a good question. Uh, probably the one that's impressed me the most would be Jimmy Page. For me, personally, just because he really seemed, well, I mean, I just don't know how he does it with the, he has an amazing feel. It's almost like he is channeling some evil gods, which he probably was talking to. Um, 
and then I guess it has to be for me Tony Iommi just for the number of the amazing riffs that he just came up with and his creation of this form. Um, I know that's a cliche, but actually, if you did listen to those first it's seven or eight albums, is phenomenal what he's doing, and it's not just riffs; it's incredibly, like a, a bit like Jimmy Page, a load of incredibly tasteful pieces of guitar work. Um, Probably those two would be the immediate two, which is not very interesting, but that's what comes to mind. And actually, a smaller example would be um, Pagan Altar, which is a UK, a small UK band from the Nawabam era who became more popular in recent times, and they're still going, and they played a few shows for us and with us. And um, yeah, their guitarist, he's incredibly underrated. He's very much from the Black Sabbath tradition, but um, yeah, Pagan Altar are really worth checking out if you like that kind of guitar. Do you have some plans uh, f mm, for touring, for example? Uh, can we have the chance to see you on, on stage in France, for example? Hope so. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously, we'd like to play Hellfest next year. <laughs> We've been there a few times to have fun, and it's always a good time. Um, but yes, I mean, we, at the moment we're trying to play as many shows as we can. At the moment, we're playing around England um, for the album, and then it's a case of. I guess we'll probably need to get someone to help us booking shows in Europe. So we'll probably get one of those booking agent people to... It's sure or not at the moment? Sorry? Sorry. Um, is it confirmed or not, the, the European shows? Nothing yet, no. So um, we're, we're trying to get some festivals ourselves um, with our own contacts. But we'll probably get a booking agent soon. So I'd say spring, hopefully, we'll come over to Europe and play some shows in France. You won't be disappointed. We will be there to, cool. to, to take some photos and to, to take a beer with you. <laughs> yeah, be good fun. Okay, so um, thank you, thank you for this interview and for the time. Um, and we, if you want, you can see our um, our review of the album on our site. It's yet published, so for, that'd be so, good. So, so and it's a really good album. And thank you for this music. Oh. We, we we love a lot. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good. Bye. Hi, this is Marek from Amulet in the UK. Um, I'm on United Rock Nations and uh, I hope you enjoy the site and I hope you enjoy the Amulet album, the first, and we'll see you in France next year. <laughs>